Greetings and welcome back to my channel. Today I would like to review this amazing box set. Charles Mingus changes the final six recordings of his life on Atlantic Records. The complete 1970s Atlantic studio recordings. But before we get into those, um, it's interesting because I think most of us focus, I know I have for many years, on all his earlier work, which is, is so amazing. There's so much of it. Um, under so many various labels, and I'll just go through a few. This is one of his great Impulse records. This is the most recent Zev Feldman production, Mingus Live at Ronnie Scott's, a great record. An unusual record on Mercury. He was on a lot of labels. Pre-Bird. Another even more unusual record on um, Solid State called Wonderland. I think this may have been on another uh, label originally, but this is a beautiful record. One of his really early records with Hampton Halls and Danny Richmond. Remember Danny Richmond, who would go on to be one of his main collaborators through the years. One of my favorites, and a recent New Land reissue, a modern jazz symposium of music and poetry with Charles Mingus. This is such a great record, and they did the whole gatefold routine. This is a beautiful recording. Um, you know, you often find reissues of this on various labels, cheaper labels. Uh, so it's nice to have a beautiful version of this, which has one of my favorite songs in jazz called Scenes in the City, which I've talked about many times on the channel. It's about a guy who loves jazz and he's always downtown, but he lives uptown and he can't make the rent and he loves jazz because it's beautiful, but not beautiful like a woman. Um, perhaps his most famous record, Canthropus Erectus, the Charlie Mingus Jazz Workshop. You know, Mingus, his character traits in song are so strong and positive and rouse, rousing and soulful and hard charging. It's a really affirmation of life. His, his greatest tunes, A Foggy Day, Profile of Jackie, Love Chant. I mean, geez, I love this record. This is the second pressing on Atlantic. Great record. Mingus Dynasty, Charles Mingus and his groups on Columbia. One of the first records I ever heard of his, and one of his earliest records, East Coasting. Just a great record with Mingus. Jimmy Nepper, the trombonist, who he was famously physical with quite a few times, even though he played on his last record. I think he punched him out. Shafi Hadi on alto and tenor, Clarence Shaw on trumpet, Danny Richmond on drums, Bill Evans on piano. Another amazing record. He has so many amazing, amazing records. Tijuana Moods. This is an early RCA copy. There's been a recent reissue, I think, on uh, Music for Pleasure or something like that. And here's one of those cheapo reissues, the Candid recordings. Speaking of which, Candid recently reissued this, but this is an original copy. Charles Mingus presents Charles Mingus on Candid. Then uh, a fantasy record with Max Roach. The Charlie Mingus Quintet plus Max Roach. And then three of his greatest records, his earliest Atlantic records. Charles Mingus the Clown, which has Haitian Fight Song, Reincarnation of a Love, Reincarnation of a Lovebird, the Clown, some of his best known, best loved recordings, material, compositions. Another great one, Charles Mingus, Tonight at Noon on Atlantic. Features the title track, Peggy's Blue Skylight, which was an amazing uh, song. I interviewed, I wrote a couple of bios for the guitarist Andy Summers back in the day, and he did a complete cover, I think a couple of uh, albums of all uh, Charles Mingus material, and that's where I first heard Bleggy's Peggy's Blue Skylight. I first heard Goodbye Pork by Hat, like many of you probably have the Jeff Beck version. I first heard uh, Duke Ellington's Sound of Love, one of his incredible compositions on a Gary Burton record. I think it's Easy as Pie. And then the recently reissued Blues and Roots. These are all essential records, which has the incredible Wednesday Night Prayer Meeting, Crying Blues, Moan Intentions, My Jelly Roll Soul. I mean, wow. Uh, Charles Mingus, easily as important in my book, 
as Louis Armstrong or Duke Ellington or Miles Davis or John Coltrane, his music is is uh, timeless and and that becomes even evident on his last three records which are kind of unusual which I'll get into. The box comes with a nice, uh, as all boxes do now, with a pretty nice booklet with giant text. I'm old, I'm not that old folks. Here's a cool photo of Mingus and Danny Richmond. Good liner notes, good explanations, good memories, good breakdowns. Now these are, are these from the, the tapes? You know, it doesn't really, we don't really know. It's not spelled out here. Remastered at John Weber at Air Studios London. That's all we get. So we don't know, are these from tapes? Are these from files? He's from, you know, I'm sure Atlantic has all their stuff in one spot. It's Atlantic Records for God's sake. But uh, there's Mingus with his wife, Sue Mingus. A very attractive lady. Um, I believe the current going price for this set is around $160. And I'll show you each one of these first, then we'll sort of get into each one. Mingus Moods from 1974. Changes 1, I think from uh, 75. Changes 2, also from 75. A live album, Three or Four Shades of Blue. Cumbia and Jazz Fusion, 1978. Me, Myself, and I, 79. And his final album, Something Like a Bird. Um, oh, then there's also a, a disc of outtakes, which are pretty cool. Uh, it's a few of the same tunes outtakes, you know, which is not that cool. Um, the first albums, the first... One, two, three. The first three albums are with his um, essential group at the time from the 70s. George, Ad George Adams on tenor sax, the great Danny Richmond on uh, drums, Jack Walworth on trumpet, sometimes Marcus Belgrave, various percussionists from time to time, Don Pullen on piano. Don Pullen is so bizarre. Um, prior to really hearing this, I'd only been aware of Pullen's work which is so free and far out, I honestly just can't take it. I just cannot take it. I mean, I can take it, but it doesn't do a lot for me. But on these records, he plays very stately, very beautiful. He was a real piano master, but he also plays quite free and out. And on these records, you still hear the sound. You know, he's still at the front of his game, composing beautiful material. Uh, this is just a great record. And as the records go on, the other members contribute material. But on Mingus Moves, he composes Canon, Opus 4, Opus 3, a tune by Don Pullen, Newcomer, George Adams, Flowers for My Lady. George Adams is so great. I only really know him through his ECM recordings, where he is just a giant. He's such a bear. Um, but that, that group is so great. It's a quintet. And occasionally other players come in and augment. Some people are singing. Uh, but this is just very powerful. I mean, you see this very infrequently. You see all these Atlantic, latter period Atlantic records very infrequently. I mean, you see all his records pretty infrequently. Uh, if, I mean, if you really want to get down to it, never mind the early Atlantics that are so valuable, um, or the later period Columbia, Columbia like She's the Fisherman's Wife. Uh, but they're all so great. And he wrote so many iconic songs. And as I said, just. They swung so hard because he was such a volatile character. I'm, uh, if you haven't seen it, there's an amazing photo of him, amazing documentary of him when he's living on 14th Street, I think, and he pulls out a shotgun and threatens to shoot somebody. No, no it's not a shotgun. It's a 22, I think. It's a rifle. Um, but he had been harassed, and you know, he was a really volatile guy, and you hear that in the music. But there's also incredible beauty in his music, along with the hard swing and... Um, complex arrangements and chordal structures. I mean, some of these latter period records, it's weird, one of them, the entire side, just basically a jam session. They play a little bit of a theme, and then you could hear the Brecker Brothers and Larry Coryell work out, and that's kind of bracing. Um, but the early records, where he's fully in control, I mean, he's in control through all these, but I'll get into that, but we're really seeing his spirit blossom, and he's such an incredible musician, such a powerful figure, and these early records from the early 70s are really indicative of that. I mean, of all these records, you see the Changes records, 
perhaps kind of often. Don't you wish they had like spent some money? I mean, why we got to have the same cover? Um, remember Rockefeller at Attica? It's actually kind of a beautiful tune. Sue's Changes is kind of beautiful. Devil Blues. And he does Duke Ellington's Sound of Love on Changes 1. And it's such a, if you haven't heard that Spotify, it's one of the most beautiful compositions in jazz. It's just, first time I heard it on a Gary Burton record, I was like, just, wow, what is that? I'd never even heard of Charles Mingus at that point. Um, and um, the second, Changes 2, he actually has Jackie Paris singing lyrics to Duke Ellington's Sound of Love, and it's kind of weak, but it's but it's sweet. Um, we also have on Changes to Free Cell Block F, Tis Nazi USA. Orange was the color of her dress, then silk blue. Both comp both compositions by Mingus. Side two, Black Bats, and pulled by Jack Walrath. And as soon as another composer comes in, everything changes. The mood gets. I mean, these are great composers in their own right, but they're not Mingus. And so Black Bats and Poles is really fast, and there's a ton of tension, but the, but the plane is like that emotionally. With Mingus, there's so many emotions, because his music dances. It's fun. It's sorrowful. It's sweet. It's sad. It's the blues. It's angry. Um, he addressed so many emotions in his material, and it's just... It's pretty amazing. Um, so both of these are great. And you can find these outside of the box. And this was really exceptional. Then we get into Charles Mingus, Three or Four Shades of Blue with Philip Catherine, George Coleman, Larry Coryell, Sonny Fortune, Jimmy Riles, John Schofield, and the Mingus Band, including Jack Walworth, Danny Richmond, Ricky Ford, Bob Nellums. This was very bracing when I first put it on to hear Better Get It In Your Soul played by a guitarist. Ba -da 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 it was really kind of bracing. That's that, that's wrong, um, but I honestly think on all these records, it's some of about Larry Coryell's best guitar work that I've ever heard. Um, he's really bluesy and swinging in places. Uh, Goodbye Pork by Hat is on here. Three or four shades of blue. Nobody knows. For some reason, I just didn't care for this record overall. Out of all of these, it just didn't really connect for me. Then. By the time we get to Cumbia and Jazz Fusion, it's 1978, and Mingus has been diagnosed with ALS. Alaterial sclerosis, I can't quite pronounce it. Same thing Stephen Hawking had. It used to be called Lou Gehrig's disease. I don't know, you might see, remember the old Lou Gehrig speech he gave, I guess, at Yankee Stadium, saying, Today, I feel like I am the luckiest man in the world. And he was diagnosed with this horrible illness. My mother had a similar illness called myositis. She was diagnosed in 2001, she passed in 2010, and she slowly just turned into a vegetable. It's a, it's a horrendous uh, disease. ALS works much quicker, thankfully, but it just uh, renders all of your limbs and your organs kind of useless. Not a good way to go. Um, but the fact that he was still working and composing while he had ALS at the end of his life is really something. Cumbia and Jazz Fusion, the first side is the title track, Cumbia and Jazz Fusion. It starts with a lot of jungle sounds, animal sounds, bird sounds. And after a while, it just, for me, just really turns into a vamp with a lot of solos. And you kind of lose interest. But the second side, music for Toto Moto, is a soundtrack um, for a movie of the time. And it is beautiful. It is really wonderful. It really reminded me Toto Moto of a Fellini soundtrack, of a Nina Rota soundtrack. It was that beautiful. At times it almost seems to go into the theme for The Godfather, which was written by Nina Rota. And that's really beautiful. That's the price you pay for this record, which you will see occasionally. I judge by what I see uh, in stores in New York. And this is, you know, half of it's wonderful and half of it's, I'm sorry, kind of a failure. Um, 1979. Me, myself, and I with the hottest cats in New York City. A big band. Now, I think I read in Gary Giddens' liner notes to this record that Mingus always wanted to hear his music played as a big band. Of course he would. He loved Duke Ellington. I would have loved to have heard his music played as a big band in the 50s or the 60s. By this point, he's not playing bass. And to a degree, this is an amazing lineup on this record. I mean, think of every great player in New York City 
in the late 1970s. Larry Coriel, Michael Brecker, Randy Brecker, Jack Walrath, Ricky Ford, Lee Connitz, George Coleman, Joe Chambers, Danny Richmond, Steve Gadd, Sammy Figueroa, Ray Mantella, Mantilla. I mean, it's an amazing band. The first track, the entire track of the first side is Three Worlds of Drums. I'm a drummer. That was really cool to hear that. To hear both Danny Richmond and Gadd and Joe Chambers trading, playing open solos. Um, but by the time we get to this era, you know, recording technologies had advanced so incredibly from the 1950s. I mean, it's like a rocket ship. And on one hand, it's really cool to hear the sound of the instruments be so modern. But on the other hand, not only do, the, do these more modern players not have the same frame of reference as the earlier players on earlier Mink, Mingus records, excepting Danny Richmond, of course, they sort of, at times it sounds like the Woody Herman band or something. It sounds like, and also it sounds so modern, it sounds like the Village, Village, uh, Village, Village Vanguard Band on a Monday night. These records, these last two, are so incredibly modern, it's both good and bad. You know, to me, part of the reason I love early pressings, I want to hear the ambiance of the studio. I want to hear what they heard on the playback through the Altec 604 monitors or something. I want that original sound. I want to buy a piece of history. I personally don't care that much about modern reissues, even though they sound beautiful on the right system. Um, and I understand why people like them, but I want to hear history. And the old recordings sound different, and particularly the Atlantic recordings, many of which Tom Dowd uh, engineered. I don't think Dom, Tom Dowd was in the same league as uh, Roy Dunan or Ree Van Gelder, but it's a different sound and they're very, very well documented. But anyway, Three Worlds of Drums is pretty crazy, um, but a lot of it just seems like an excuse for a blowing session. And then he does uh, covers of his earlier material, Devil Woman, Wednesday Night Prayer Meeting, and again, you know, the, those earlier Mingus records I held up, there's so much atmosphere to those records. There's a languorous feeling, even when the stuff's fast. There's a sense of humor. It reflects the era in which it was recorded. New York in the 1970s, that's this New York at its nadir as far as a decent place to live. You know, that's, era, that's sort of the era I love, Taxi Driver and the real visceral edge of New York City. And you, but you can hear it in these musicians and the way they play. Michael Brecker's great, but if I hear him play another endless string of, you know, 30-second notes, I'm just, it's enough already. Um, so, I don't know, not entirely successful. It's interesting as a curio, because it just, it sounds so modern, and it does sound, just from the interpretation, it sounds like a very contemporary band when you play these records. Same thing with this one, Mingus, something like a bird. First side, all the first side and half of the second side is just straight up and down, just a blowing session. Um, it's a great blowing session, amazing players. Eddie Gomez is on all this latter period stuff and he really sounds wonderful. The stuff is beautifully recorded. And I bet Mingus, you know, he loved, I'm sure, hearing this back. His music played back in an exceptional Atlantic studio with these great players, you know, state of the art. In some ways, these are state of the art recordings for musicians working in the late 1970s. It's a wonderful sound. It must have been very expensive. Um, but something like a bird really is just reasons for a bunch of guys to take solos over kind of a vamp. It's all pretty fast. Uh, there's not a lot of Mingus in there, but the last track, Farewell, Farewell, is a quintessential, beautiful Mingus composition with all that beauty and sweet flowing atmosphere and those incredibly catchy melodies that really tug at your heart. Um, boy, he, he could tug at your heart, he could tug at your butt, he could tug at your brain. He was such a masterful composer and musician and a very innovative bass player. And I think Farwell was a friend of his, like the band manager or something. So this is about 160 bucks, um, and I think it's worth it. Uh, particularly for the first three records, Changes, Mingus Moves, Changes 1 and 2. Cumbia and Jazz Fusion is interesting. And if you want to hear his music played by contemporary musicians, because I think all these guys, I mean, a lot of these guys are dead, but Gad certainly isn't, and a lot of the other people are still around, Randy Brecker, it's really unusual to hear it. Anyway, hope you like this. I appreciate you checking in.
Next up, I think I'm going to have an interview with Bernie Grunman.